Hello. Hi, Faith. Hi. Good afternoon. Now, I think I can hear you only a little. Can we make oh. it louder? Okay. Um, can you hear that better? A little Hi, louder. Hi, everybody. Please. This is our friend, Faith Wheeler, and she's going to be, um, what do you call it? Moderating. Moderating, moderating for us today. So um, we're glad to be here together. Faith, where are you? You look like you have palm trees in the background there. Um, I know. I Since the book was about travel, I am in Mexico. Um, keeping up the traveling theme, my travels with Mrs. Kennedy. Um, so yes, I am far away. And, and I we're just in, uh, want to make sure California. I can hear you. Is there a way to make you any louder? Um. Let me ask Olivia. I think she just posted something on her. Uh, we have someone helping us here. Bear with us because yes, this is just one moment. Minutes. Because try it now. Um, all right. I think yep. Olivia okay. was gonna. Well, we're gonna we're gonna do our very best. Um, can you to, hear me better hear than you? As well as I did before we started, but here we are. We are with Lisa Hill, okay. uh, Lisa McCubbin Hill, and Clint Hill. And anyone who's joined us today are familiar with these luminaries because that's what they are, each of them in their own right. They are, I consider, muses for each other. Um, of course, Clint Hill from 1958 until 1975, one of the most decorated Secret Service gentlemen ever to grace the United States, the assistant director um, to all protective activity by the time he left. And had it not been for Lisa, we would never know his story. Um, and his story is fantastic. So what makes this book special, and I know many of you have purchased this book and you're in for a treat, is it sort of unfolded by accident. Um, I want to hear more about that because in 2019, you both thought you had a terrible task to do it seemed onerous and miserable to go to an old home in Alexandria, Virginia, and dig through dusty old boxes. And instead, you found a buried treasure. And there is a picture of this buried treasure. And tell me about that. Well, I had owned this home in Alexandria, Virginia for since 1967. And I hadn't lived there uh, for a number of years, and I thought it was time to sell it, but I wanted to make sure it was okay to sell, and I didn't know for sure what was still remaining in the home. We, I had cleaned out most of the stuff I knew, but there were certain things still there, I was sure. So Lisa and I happened to be in Washington, D.C. at the time, so we went out to the house to examine it to make sure uh, what we needed to do. I thought maybe I'd just get there and call 1-800-JUNK, <laughs> and have them come out and just take everything that was inside. So That's what he parts. wanted to do. That would have been the easy. Uh -huh. But I said there was there were a few things that he had never been able to find. And one of them was the medal that he had been given after the assassination, his medal for bravery from the Treasury Department. And he just had hidden it away, put it away somewhere back in 1963. And it, it didn't, he said it didn't mean anything to him. And he, all these years later, had no idea where it was. So I said, you know, Clint, why don't we try to find that at least? Because that is important. And, you know, I'd hate to see it end up on eBay somewhere. So, um, so we started cleaning out the house. And one of the first things we found was this trunk in the garage underneath a box that contained a craftsman wet dry vac. I mean, you know, you kind of had to dig to find it. And I pulled off this box and I saw that trunk, which says on it, Clinton J. Hill, the White House, Washington, D.C. So wouldn't you want to open up that trunk and see what's in it? <laughs> it's a buried treasure um, that no one would even believe is an honest to God true story, which is what makes this book so fantastic. And it takes you through, as a result of finding these things, I am guessing many memories were jogged. Um, memories you hadn't thought of, pictures tell a thousand words. And I'm sure there were things you didn't even know you had in there. There exactly was, that was the case. Uh, I 
she found things within the trunk of things that I thought that I had uh, either destroyed or did something with. It. And uh, it was a really remarkable to have this, these things come out. And each one had its own story and its own memory for me. And I sat, sat stood there looking at them and, and uh, going back in time, uh, being uh, there from 1960 to 1964. It was Unbelievable. Yeah. What, what also I thought was done so well in this book is how you use the things you found to tell the story encompassing your trips and for the reader to be able to go on your visits with Mrs. Kennedy around the world in an intimate way was spectacular. And the, the first question I asked myself is, after working with presidents, how did you get assigned Mrs. Kennedy and not President Kennedy? And well, at the time, at the time I received that assignment, I was asking the same question. <laughs> <laughs> Why was I given this assignment? Because I really didn't want it. I knew how the agents had operated with both Beth Truman and Mamie Eisenhower, and that was they watched Canasta games being played. They went to uh, large stores like uh, J.C. Penney, where they could <laughs> buy, uh, you know, less than expensive things. Uh, but that turned out not to be the case with business. Kennedy. And I was extremely fortunate that I got the assignment because I, it turned out that I had the best assignment of any agent in the Secret Service. Without question. Without question, I think the, the combination of all of the places you went and Mrs. Kennedy's ability to constantly amuse and surprise you <laughs> with all of her adventures that it seems like she would almost spontaneously add along the way. And we start in Paris. Um, and Paris, of course, a place very close to my heart. I can just picture you in Paris with Mrs. Kennedy when she somehow manages to convince the prime minister of culture to lend her the Mona Lisa for the United <laughs> States. How, how did that go down? Well, I mean, see, when we were in France, one of the things that uh, the State Department always does is sign it an interpreter to the president and to the first lady. Well, the president needed one because he did not speak French. Mrs. Kennedy did not need one. She could speak French fluently. And so she dealt personally one-on-one -on -one with President de Gaulle and Prime Minister or a, a Minister of Culture, Andre Malraux. And it was Minister of Cultural Monroe that she really convinced to intercede on her and the people of the United States' behalf with de Gaulle mm -hmm. to permit the Mona Lisa to be removed from France, transported to the United States under very strict, secure conditions, and placed on display for the people of the United States to go and see. Uh, it had never happened before. The Mona Lisa had never left France, but this is the first occasion that that had occurred. I, I can promise it will never happen again. Uh, her, her, she was, had so much guile and politesse. In fact, another part of the book that's astounding is when you discuss the various gifts um, that were given to her around the world, whether it be tigers, little baby tigers in India, or a gorgeous scarf, which is an easy thing to transport. But then in Pakistan, I, I really couldn't believe, is it true that, well, it is, because the book says they <laughs> wanted to give Mrs. Kennedy a horse, a, a horse named Sardar in Pakistan. And can you elaborate on that story? Because I, I, you, your job is to get the horse home and this is not what one would think your job description includes. No, it did not. And uh, <laughs> when I and I had no advanced knowledge that she was going to be presented with this horse. And we were at the International Stock and Horse uh, Show, cattle show, I guess, too, up in uh, Lahore, Pakistan. 
and uh, we were the guests of pri President uh, Ayub Khan. And she and he arrived at this function in a beautiful open chariot with being pulled by horses. It was a remarkable sight. Into the grandstand, watch some display of various things out on the field. And then he asked her to come out on the field with him, which she did. And I accompanied her. And the U.S. ambassador to Pakistan also accompanied me. And uh, got out there and they brought out this horse. And he presented it to her as a gift from the people of Pakistan. Now, she was elated. <laughs> and I was standing behind her saying to myself, how am I going to get this damn horse back to Washington? Because <laughs> I knew it was going to be a problem. And it was a problem. <laughs> but fortunately for me, I was able to give the problems to somebody else. <laughs> and so between the State Department and the Department of Defense, they were going to get the horse back to Washington. The Department of Defense. <laughs> well, the president decided that his Air Force uh, liaison man in the White House, who was a one-star general, Godfrey McHugh, would take care of it for him. He was given strict instructions. No one, no one was to know about this. And why? So, and why was the why was that the case? He did not want it to people it, it to appear that they were spending uh, federal funds <laughs> for a horse for Mrs. Kennedy's pleasure. And it had it was supposed to be in quarantine, right? Any animal Well, any that animal place. that comes into the country like that has to be strict strictly uh, watched and they put them in quarantine for a period of 30 days or so. And she knew that and she was fearful that it was going to happen to this horse. And she did not want it to happen. In fact, she wrote a, the president was out in, in California at the time. And we're, here we are over in, in Pakistan. And uh, so she sent him a telegram. And in that telegram, she said, she pointed out that if Prince Charles had a horse in the United States, there would be no need to quarantine him when he came back from the United States to England or vice versa. They just take care of it for him. They should do the same now for Sardar. <laughs> and she also said that uh, you'd never do that to a member of your family, have them quarantined wow. for 30 days. She said that uh, you have to remember now that you're a politician. The people in PETA <laughs> that protect the rights of animals will never vote for you again if you cause this poor horse to go through a 30-day quarantine period. Wow. A lot of it was really funny to read. <laughs> and consequently, they tried their best to get the horse back as quickly as possible. The poor, the poor general, he had a horrible time. He kept calling me because he was supposed to keep me advised. And he'd give me an update. And he'd call me up and he'd say, Clint, I said, damn it. He said, now we've got another problem. I say, what's the problem? It's not just the horse. The president of Pakistan has assigned a member of the military to accompany the horse. And he's here in his red tunic. And I can't get rid of him. And a turban. He's, right? he's got a he's turban, turban on. He's whole, one of these okay. doesn't have as a spear. It's a uh, superb photo when you just see not only is there a horse, but there's a surprise gentleman too. Um, it's unbelievable. And Lisa, quickly, because we want to open up for questions. You found something really interesting in this suitcase, or excuse me, trunk as well, and you thought it was a pocket knife. Can you just quickly, because um, that pocket knife is, is not truly a pocket knife, tell us all, what is it that you found? So this is what I found, okay? And doesn't it look like a pocket knife? Yeah, I, think so. <laughs> and I, I brought it to Clint and I, actually it was in a box. It was in this box. So, and um, I opened it up because I, it was addressed to um, somebody on the box. And so I said, Clint, I found this. What is this? And he said, oh, I'll tell you what that is. It's a spy camera. And of course. He, we open it up 
and you can see it is wow. indeed this little camera with you know the f-stop and the asa and all of that and it had there was actual film little tiny film that goes in this and in the box was a stack of photographs that have never been seen before taken by clint he had totally forgotten that he had <coughs> them from his trip to Ravello with Jacqueline Kennedy. And um, it ties into another story in India where she had one of these cameras. And so, I don't know, it just was kind of unbelievable to me that we actually found this in the trunk and I'm so glad he didn't call 1-800-GOT-JUNK. Yeah, it's, 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 an, it's unbelievable. I mean, there is no such thing as a coincidence, I guess, or an accident, but this one is, beyond beyond so um with no further ado i'm gonna take you over to some of our um live questions and the first one comes to a, us from philip in sacramento california and he says um, my thank you to clint and lisa for writing the great histories about your experiences with the kennedys how did you decide to share your story i'm so thankful you did well, well, we knew when we opened the trunk and found all this material that there was a story there. And then COVID came along and we were confined to the house for a long period of time. And so we were looking for things to do and we thought that'd be a nice project. So we <laughs> put together a book during that period of time. And this is what how it turned out. But I, I think maybe he was also asking, how did you originally decide to tell your story? Like with our first book that we wrote, how did that? Come well, about? that was way back in the beginning in 2009 when I met you uh, on another project, and I had talked to you for a couple hours, and then we talked together periodically after that, and we started to travel together to further a book uh, that was being was written by you and another gentleman. The Kennedy and detail. I got to know you better and I trusted you and I started to open up and I discussed with you things that I had not talked with anybody else about, specifically the assassination. And I got to trust you and out of that came a book called Mrs. Kennedy and Me. And uh, that was a success. The publisher was pleased. So they came back and had us write another book. Uh, and on the anniversary of the assassination. It's called Five Days in November. So that was somewhat of a success. So then they wanted another book. And so that turned out to be Five Presidents. My uh, journey with Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, and Ford. So now this is book number four for two of Lisa us. and myself. And it uh, hopefully will do well. And let me just tell you, when we were writing Mrs. Kennedy and Me, the first book we wrote together, uh, as we were going along, there were two things Clint kept saying to me. He said, do you really think anybody's going to be interested in this? And then the other thing was, do you really think we have enough material for a whole book? Wow. Isn't that something? And I'll answer Philip by saying, had it not been for Lisa, who doggedly was going to accomplish this yeah. as uh, with all of her might and power and grace, I'm not sure all these stories would have been divulged, which is what I think makes it so neat when two people can complement each other so naturally and well. And Clint, well, it is, it is true. To... None of this would have happened without Lisa. No way. Sorry, Clint, but no way. <laughs> and the trust is, is big, right? To trust a journalist and also living in your life surrounded by journalists who Mrs. Kennedy was not always a fan of. It probably took some time to, to trust a journalist, frankly. Um, okay, sure. let's, let's move on to um, Joe from Choctaw, Oklahoma, who, at, who says... Hello, Mr. Hill. If you had to describe President and Mrs. Kennedy in one word, what word would you choose for each of them? Oh, I don't think you could describe anybody with just one word. Yeah, it's a tough Most note. people are too broad in, in every aspect of their life to have a one word description made of them. I think that would be impossible. Yeah. Maybe a few words? Yeah. 
Well, I mean, each one of, you know, there were very intelligent. Mrs. Kenny was very athletic. She swam like a fish. She water skied, played tennis, played uh, golf. Uh, she was excellent equestrian, rode horses all the time, loved it. She just wanted to be as active as possible. The president, even though he had a bad back, he played golf as often as he possibly could. He, he was an excellent swimmer. His story regarding BT 109 will attest to that. He swam for miles to save some of his crew members. Uh, so, I mean, they were very active. They, they really were active physically and mentally they were brilliant people. Uh, Mrs. Kennedy didn't take anything on or do anything without complete study of that subject, no matter what it was. Uh, I know I've shot, when she prepared herself to give a tour of the White House to, to a national network, she studied days on end to make sure she had all the information necessary to do the job, and she did it beautifully. Wow, and she spoke several languages, didn't she? Yes, she, she did. She was multilingual. She spoke French, Spanish, Italian, and I think she she knew some Greek and obviously learned more later. And um, so, I mean, she was, and, and she used those skills when we traveled to commute, communicate with the local populace. And they loved that. Someone like she speaking in, in their own language made a big difference. Absolutely, absolutely. In fact, Molly from Wakefield, Massachusetts asked you, what was your favorite place you got to visit with Mrs. Kennedy? <coughs> Sorry, Clint has a chronic cough, so just bear with him. Well, I mean, if from the official place probably would have been, uh, probably in Pakistan. The Khyber Pass. Something so, about that horse. It was very difficult. <laughs> and the most fun place probably was Ravello, Italy, because it was a vacation type uh, setting for Mrs. Kennedy and Caroline and her sister Lee and Lee's husband, Prince Raduel, and some friends. Uh, and they all had a wonderful time. So, I mean, there, and every place we went was enjoyable, whether it be Palm, Spray, Palm Beach, Florida, or Hannesport, uh, Massachusetts, or even Oscar Middleburg, Virginia, in the, in the Hunt country. Yeah, there were so many. And I saw Vermont and Antigua and so many wonderful places. Um, Chris from Vancouver asks, did you ever try to contact Mrs. Kennedy in your years after the Secret Service? No, after uh, the last time I talked with her, was in 1968. Uh, she was, I was at that time uh, the agent in charge of presidential protection. Lyndon Johnson was the president. And this was right after Robert Kennedy was killed and they brought his body by train to Washington, D.C. She was on the train with the body and I accompanied President Johnson to the train station to meet the train and and uh, meet the body that was brought, being brought down by the family. Uh, at that time, spoke briefly to Mrs. Kennedy, very brief, but she and I interchanged uh, pleasantries, if you want to call it that. And, but that was the last time I talked with her. And of course, then she married um, to Aristotle Onassis, so I would think that too would perhaps create more distance um, Perhaps. True. I mean, she, act, she got married that fall. Bobby Kennedy was killed in June, and she got married the following October, I believe it was. In 68. In 1968. Yeah. Um, okay. Harry from Mesa, Arizona said, did you ever play, or asks, did you ever play any practical jokes on Jackie, or have any played on you by her? And if so... What was the best one? 
practical jokes. No, we we didn't. You know, I didn't. We didn't play any practical jokes. Um, we were too busy, and <laughs> she was having a good enough time without that being necessary. So we didn't play practical jokes on each other. And and also, I noticed on that. It, I don't believe you called her Jackie. I believe you always called her Mrs. Kennedy. And interestingly, I noticed she always called you Mr. Hill. Did, That's did correct. Other, did other presidents refer to you as Mr. Hill? Well, she called me Mr. Hill, and I called her Mrs. Kennedy. It was out of respect. Mm -hmm. And it showed everybody who was listening our place. We, we understood our places and relationship to each other. Mm -hmm. And I think it was the best thing we could do was refer to each other in those uh, that way. So it worked very well for us, at least. But um, the president didn't call you Mr. Hill. No, the president called me Clint. <laughs> the formality is so lovely. Um, <laughs> what about like later <clears throat> ladies did, um, cause you were around uh, Mrs. Johnson did she call you Mr. Hill? No, she called me Clint. Hmm. So it is kind of funny, isn't it, Faith, that here it, it is close it relationship. Is. And she, they... she exalted his position to be of equal and wasn't just going to call him Clint. Right. Or Dazzle, for that matter. Did she ever call you Dazzle? <laughs> so there were some times you might have to do you need to step away? You okay? Yeah. Um yeah, in the book, we detail um, a, a little story where she calls him Dazzle, and it surprises him. And um, it's one of my favorite stories. Actually, it takes place when this picture was being taken mm -hmm. or, or was around the same time when she was there on the yacht in Ravello with her own camera. And um, those are some of my favorite stories and photographs in this yes. book from Ravello. We had so many, I don't know, hundreds of photographs from Ravello that we could have used. <coughs> we could have made an entire book out of Ravello and it was really hard to narrow them down and choose the photos that we did. Yeah, it does seem as if it's a treasure trove, just an absolute treasure trove of, it should be a big book, this big, so everyone can <laughs> have it on a coffee table or several of these. Um, okay, we've got Ron Wart from the Netherlands, who oh, says, hello. yeah, hello, Ron from the Netherlands. I wonder what time it is there. <laughs> um, he was with an ad adjutant general once who worked for the Queen in the Netherlands, and he escorted Winston Churchill during his stay in 1946. He showed me presents he got from Churchill during his visit, a cigar, a signed photo and a silver engraved cigarette box. What is your most treasured gift from your days with JFK and Mrs. Kennedy? <coughs> well, I guess it would be a paper medal. Oh yes. Created by Mrs. Kennedy, signed by the by the president. That was given to me in uh, February of 1963 after completing a 50 mile hike without previous knowing I was going to have to do that, uh, accompanying Prince Radziwill, Mrs. Kennedy's brother-in-law and a friend of the president, Chuck Spaulding down in Florida. And I did so at the request of President and Mrs. Kennedy. And when it was complete, they had a little party and that's when I was presented with this paper. It's made out of construction paper. And I still have it. It's uh, it's priceless. There's a terrific photo of that in the book, and I I do remember the story now that you mention it because you had to walk 50 miles in your floor shines. Correct, <laughs> correct. In my floor shine shoes. We're still waiting for floor shine to offer him a sponsorship or something. Yeah, so. oh. I think he deserves it. You know, the, Absolutely. The, the basketball, these basketball players get all that stuff that, that for shoes. <laughs> I don't even get a spare shoelaces. Nothing. Gosh, I, you're not Come on, Florsheim. I know. Or maybe another <laughs> sneaker company should jump in and do better. Right. Um, okay, let's see. Chris from St. Louis, Missouri. He wants to know what your fondest memory of Mrs. Kennedy is. My fondest memory? 
Mm. Never thought of that. I guess watching her with her children and the president out in Middleburg, uh, probably because no press around. We, the agents, we kept our distance so that they could operate it, be just a family. And that's really uh, what they love to do in their Middleburg, Titus Border, Palm Beach. Palm Beach Christmases were very nice for them because uh, they were all together. And uh, generally speaking, her sister and husband would be there too. And they have two children. So uh, just family time of President Mrs. Kennedy and the children. That was the fondest, that's the fondest memory. Right, when you're not surrounded by people and gawkers and something a little more natural. Yes, it was very private. I mean, they had a lot of time to themselves during that, you know, those events that there were no press, no public, just them as a family. Yeah, I, I, that makes a lot of sense. I think that's something that, you know, a lot of people have this image of the Kennedys that, you know, there are all these scandalous stories and things, and they they don't have this idea of them being this cohesive family. But that's something Clint has always said that he saw was that President and Mrs. Kennedy really had a, a wonderful relationship with each other, much affection for each other, and really respected each other. Very much so. Uh, yeah. it, was very, it was very visible throughout their entire a time that I was with them, but even became more so in August of 2000 or 1963 when young, their youngest child was born, Patrick Bouvier Kennedy, and then he died two days later. Uh, so, I mean, after that, they held hands in public, they caressed in public, they just, they just didn't mind at all that the press were there or that anybody else was there. They had themselves each other. They yeah, held I, I, know, I know you said in the book, and I thought it was also very powerful being a kid from North Dakota, not coming from a large family, to be part of this large family. <coughs> That's true. It, it makes a difference. And my, I was very close with my family, very not many of us, but uh, we were very close, and I appreciated that in President and Mrs. Kennedy. Mm -hmm. Tom, now we have from Little Canada, Minnesota. Clint and Lisa, so happy to see you two connect in marriage. Now my question, who made the first move to make this happen? Wow, to make the marriage happen? <laughs> I guess. I think he's asking a little bit about your personal life. Well, I guess I would have probably made the first move, but uh, there wasn't much resistance. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, um, we spent so much time together um, initially after we met. And, um, you know, I don't think either, I know neither one of us was you know, looking for no. something in each other and never expected it. And it just happened very naturally. And um, it kind of got to the point where, you know, we um, just loved spending time together. We, we almost finished each other's well, sentences. That's what we actually did finish each other's sentences on occasion. And when that happened, I realized, well, you know, there's something here that it's, it's very unlike my, any relationship I've had before, uh, maybe this is a, the closer. Yeah. We used to say, we're in sync. We were always in sync. We go to a restaurant and we look at the menu and say, well, what are you thinking of getting? And we always both wanted the exact same thing. You know, we, we just have very similar tastes and, um, you know, I love spending time with him. At first he couldn't believe that I was really interested in him. And I thought, gosh, who wouldn't be interested in this wonderful well, man? <laughs> she's too too attractive for for me. I mean, that's what bothered me is that I couldn't believe she would be interested in this old guy. Oh well, you definitely are, are the perfect complement. You see things beautifully together, and each of you bring to the table so much. It's it's 
It's spectacular. Your perfect union. Almost one year anniversary, too. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Been close. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Let's see. What else have we got here? Um, huh. Wesley from St. Augustine, Florida says, asks, were there any tense moments acting as Mrs. Kennedy's protection detail? Events where you had to go into a defensive posture or a direct attack or assault against the detail. Then he writes, love your books and interviews. You're an inspiration and your humility, candor, and your loyal service to our country. America needs more Clint Hills. And I'll second uh, that. <laughs> really? Sweet. Well, you know, I guess most people don't realize it. We, there were only two of us who were assigned to uh, protect Mrs. Kennedy. Just two agents. And we had some supplemental help usually wherever we were. But uh, fortunately for us, we didn't have a, a lot of uh, threats that really turned out to be much toward Mrs. Kennedy. The threats were mostly toward her husband. Uh, but we had to be very cautious. Uh, there were certain times in, in the time I was there from 60 to 64, the missile Cuban crisis, for example, where we had uh, to make sure that we were prepared to do certain things in the event certain things happened. And then she would uh, tell me that uh, what I had planned or what the Secret Service had planned was not what she was going to do. And it was uh, something that I did not anticipate. So uh, it was interesting, but... Uh, well, I remember you telling me one of the things, because I had asked him this question before, was that one of your big concerns was kidnapping. Oh, sure, because the kids. Yeah. Well, she too, but the kids. Because they, you know, we we always wanted to get them out and about, to take them to the parks, do whatever. Let them be as normal little children as they possibly can be. And that was her intent, too. She wanted them to grow up just like any other kid on the block that wasn't named Kennedy and didn't have a father who was president. And I told her many, many times that, uh, you know, they're always going to be considered special because they are the children of a president. And I, mm -hmm. you know, and she said she understood that, but she wanted to be absolutely sure that she gave them every opportunity to grow up just like every other youngster in this country. And I would think post assassination, your job, Probably got tougher. I mean, now people. She was. She was always admired and sought after. But now here she was living in New York, and I know there was a time she took the kids out in Central Park on a boat, and you later learned there were photos taken. So I. It almost I would think became a little more difficult to be her detail then. Um, well, New York was New York was special because. I, we found that in New York, the people in New York are so busy trying to get from point A to point B or doing something else. They really don't pay attention who's standing next to them in line or who's walking down the street. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Washington, D.C., everybody knows, they're, lo they're always looking for somebody who's important or well-known. Yes. But in New York, people just don't, and the tourists are there are so enamored by the buildings or all their heads are up, they're looking at, oh, look at that, that's 75 stories. <laughs> they don't see anybody walking on the street. So it was really an advantage to have her living in New York in 1964. People just didn't pay attention to her. Yeah, yeah. Then along came a, a guy, a camera guy, who caused problems. But until he showed up, it was pretty good. Mm. But it was always... Wasn't it your um, kind of your biggest concern was helping her maintain her privacy because oh, yeah. the paparazzi were just rampant whenever they found out she was anywhere. And that always oh, well, became yeah. your job. You know, like going to the theater in New York, that was a special event. We'd have to have a lot of help from New York's uh, field office and from the Bureau of Special Services and the police department to get us into and out of a 
a theater because she loved to go to the theater in New York. And we went fairly, very often. So Mike from Irwin, Tennessee asks a good question. What advice do you have for young people today considering becoming United States Secret Service agents? Well, study hard. Be involved in as many activities as you can in school. And keep your nose clean. Don't get involved in any situation where you're with friends who are uh, involved in whether it be illicit drugs or anything else. I mean, you have to, in this day and age, I, youngsters really have to be careful as to their associations because they can so easily go from bad to really worse just because they're associated with somebody who made a bad mistake. So, it's uh, much more difficult, I think, raising children today than it's ever been, probably. There's so many things. Social media didn't help. That uh, makes it much, even much worse than it used to be. Yeah, yeah, it's so true. Times have changed, and she is an icon of the good old days where things were <laughs> elegant and graceful. <laughs> um, so true. It, Jacob, you, you bring that up. One of the things I think about this book is it does take you back to that time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, I think I think it was Clint said at one point there was something horrible going on in the news. You know, as every day almost, and he said, you know, the world could use a little Camelot right now. And so you know, where this kind of takes you back to a time of innocence um, and. I don't know, it just is really, with all the photographs, I think it will bring people back to that time and offer a sense of hope and nostalgia. That's really true, Lisa. And the beauty too, you know, much of her finesse was in her elegance, her beauty, her opulence, and her, her desire to share that. And so we could be a country proud of, of someone who had so much politesse. Um, I guess the last question, um, oh, <laughs> actually, we just got one more. This is funny. Gary from Parker, Colorado says, Mr. Hill, if enough of us write your name in for president, would you serve a couple of terms? If, <laughs> you know, you, you don't want me in that, in that job, and I don't want that job. Believe me. I've seen what happens to the poor guys that get the job. <laughs> I actually tried that in, was it 2012? Was that a presidential election year? Probably. When our first book was coming out, yeah, I said, you know what? We should, you know, you should run for president. We might be able to get some more book sales <laughs> because of that. Because <laughs> I, I too, I agree. I think he is the kind of man we need as a president. Unfortunately, he's the kind of man who's too smart to ever want to run for president. Yeah, that's true. He, he must remain just a national treasure. It's, it's, it's nice and simple and that it's perfect for you. <laughs> um, one last one, I guess we, could, we have time for. Um, Jacob from Mandan, North Dakota. Mandan. You must, know, you must know where that is. I know where Mandan is. Hello, Mandan. Hello, North Dakota. Okay. He wants to know... What was your favorite joke from JFK? My favorite joke from JFK. I don't recall him ever telling a joke. <laughs> Not to me, anyway. Um, was he a jokester? Not really. Uh, no. Nah. He was always so, you know carefree and, uh, and jovial and a friend, uh, but he always had that little thing in the back of his head about the business, keep the business going. Uh, I, I really don't know the joke that he ever pulled on anybody or said or told. I, I don't really know any joke uh, that he told. Unfortunately, I'm sorry, man, Dan, I couldn't <laughs> answer your question. <laughs> you know what I just thought of? There's um, there's a great photo in the book 
um, that that was in Virginia, and I know this is one of your favorites, and there's a video of it where the president oh. is with a horse. Yeah. So tell tell that story. Well, they had this new place on Virginia called Wexford. It was a new 40-acre uh, little farmette that they uh, purchased the land, and then she uh, had the house built there. We were out there. It was just about two weeks before the assassination. And they were there on a weekend, and they had friends there with them. And uh, they had gotten the new, new pony had been given to the children from, I think it was the president of, of, of uh, Ireland. And he was called Leprechaun. And Mrs. Kennedy uh, had told the president to put something in his pockets. It was sugar cubes. Mm. And so they were sitting up by the house and Leprechaun was let loose and he was walking around much not grass and stuff. He finally got over close to the president. He must have smelled these sugar cubes. <laughs> and he started to try and get into the president's pockets. <laughs> and he was muzzling him and <laughs> the president was laughing so hard. Uh, it was really funny to watch. And it was, I was there and uh, a couple other uh, agents and uh, Mrs. Kennedy and some friends of theirs. And un didn't I thought maybe she had snuck the sugar cubes into his pocket well, she, so he didn't know. Have. And then the horse came over. She may have because he uh, at first he was completely unaware of what was going on. <laughs> And he, but he was sitting with his back against the wall of the, he was sitting on the ground with his back against the wall of the house and this little pony comes up and starts to, to, to nuzzle in <laughs> and he must have smelled what he had in his pockets and he was after it he was going to get it it was funny yeah, that, that photo is in the book I believe it, along with other amazing horse pictures Jack you know Mrs. Kenny and her I think Carolyn or maybe it was her son just effortlessly sitting on a horse as if, you know, you could just take a little baby on a horse, no problem. No, <laughs> it's, she, it's quite something. There's over, I think we have, well, there's over 200 photographs in the book and they're all rare or never before published. So um, there's many, many photos that people have never seen before. Um, some that we found in the trunk or in the house as we were cleaning it out and others that we just sort of curated as the stories came out and we discovered photos from different sources. Um, and that was really one of the fun things of this book is finding all the photographs and then Clint being able to tell the stories behind every photograph. And that in itself, I think, is a treasure. His photo, Clint, your photographic mind, I mean, your ability to remember the details, and Lisa, the way you effortlessly take us on this journey, you truly feel like you're along for the ride. It is such an exciting book. I'm so happy for you. I want everyone to have several copies, not just for yourself, but these are signed copies. Thanks to Premier Collectibles, these folks have writer's cramp. <laughs> They've been signing and signing and signing up to a thousand copies and I think 500 are gone or maybe more. So don't miss your chance. My last question I had to ask, and it's not a tough one. Some of the quotations in the book really charmed me. And, and one of them is Mr. Hill often said to Mrs. Kennedy, whatever you want to do is what we're going to do. And so my question is, do you say that to Lisa? Do I think what? Do you say that? To, do you say that to Lisa? As a matter of fact, I do. <laughs> oh. I say that to her. I say, um, remember last night she said something about dinner, and I said, well, whatever you decide, dinner's going to be. That's what I'm going to eat. <laughs> Every I, single day around the world, take note. <laughs> I mean, this is a happy union right here. I want everyone to think about that <laughs> and thank you both can i add one more thing i don't know if your sweet husband your sweet partner john is around or if you wanted john. to come into the camera 
But Mr. Technician. Lost to Is John here? Mr. <laughs> Mr. John, the technician. Oh, we. Oh, you know, Mr. John is here. Okay, Mr. Mr. John. Maybe, maybe we, see him. We want to say Mr. Mr. Lamar. Thank yes, you. We, we, we've saved some time for the Mr. Lamar moment. You come to here, please. <laughs> John Lamar, our special mystery guest. There Hi, he is. John. So Hi, guys. we have to tell everybody. Um, in the acknowledgments page, you'll see Faith Wheeler's name and John Lamar's name because the whole time we were writing this book, it was called Travels with Mrs. Kennedy. And we got to the end and we were choosing the cover photo and we had many conversations with John and Faith. They come over to our house frequently and Faith cooks dinner because I'm not a very good cook and Faith is an excellent <laughs> chef. And um, we gladly let her do that. And um, and we were talking about the cover photo. And John said, well, shouldn't it be my travels with Mrs. Kennedy? And we all went, why, yes, it should. <laughs> why did we not think about that? that? So the, the title is all because of this man right here. So thank you, John. Well, well thank you, John. Being the literary genius that I am. It was, uh... <laughs> thank you. <laughs> And I, I didn't know I was going to be on camera. I'm sitting here in a T-shirt, yeah, so I'm a bit of a good. You look good. You look good. Thank you for popping in. <laughs> you bet. You bet. Great to see Thanks. you guys. Good to see you. Thank you both. Thank you, Premier Collectibles. That was so much fun. I hope I answered every question that came through. And I'm sure people will be writing you and sending you notes. And and thank you for, for both being my friends and my luminaries. Thank, well, you. thank you, Faith. And thank you, everybody who tuned in. Um, we hope it was fun. We had a great time. So um, enjoy the book and let us know what you think. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching. Hey, this is John Acuff, New York Times best-selling author of seven books and someone who's done a live signing. If you like the one you just watched, make sure you check out our YouTube channel. It's full of amazing authors having great conversations and signing books for viewers just like you. So make sure you subscribe and thanks for watching today.